Thank you for joining us today. The sermon title is, Where Are You? Well, I know for many of us who kind of went to boarding school or went on a long school trip, you probably at some point in that trip or that time away wanted to come home. For those of you that have kind of went off to university or wherever it was, left home at a certain age, I'm sure there were times that you wanted to come home. And for some of you I know who have family overseas and whatever, you really want them to come home. And they, well, they probably themselves want to come home, especially around Christmas time or around Easter time, to be with the family and to be part of those gatherings. But today, just to share with you a story, again, it's, it comes to us from, from Simon and Garfunkel, uh, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel, who wrote this wonderful uh, song way back when, in the midst of time, uh, called The Boxer. Many of you will recognize it, but it's a story about a, a young boy going off to New York to follow his dreams, and yet he, he kind of comes across the harsh life of the city. And then penniless, with only strangers as friends, he spends his days, as they sang, laying low, seeking out the poor quarters where the ragged people go, looking for the places that only they would know. And I'm sure that song will stick with you for the rest of the day. And I'm sure that you can kind of picture the scene, though, this young man, dirty face, worn clothes, looking for work, finding none. He walks the sidewalks, he, he battles the cold of New York City. His desire for home is acute within him because it's a place where the New York City winters are bleeding me. He wants to go home. And for me, the big idea today is this. Each one of us has a God gap. Each one of us has a kind of spiritual vacuum inside of us that we need to fill, that we need it to fill so that we can be right with God. And each one of us will be spiritually restless until we kind of find our spiritual home, until we, we get home, so to speak. And oh boy, oh boy, do we search in all kinds of places. I know I did. Some of us search for it by pouring all our energy into various things. Maybe for you it was sport. Maybe for you it was organizations that you are part of. Maybe for you it was business. I don't know, maybe for you it was family, whatever it is. Maybe for you it's been investments or collecting things, you know, collecting stuff. And I've been good at all of those at some point in time. And then one day you open yourself up and you recognize it for what it is. God seems to stretch out his hand. It's the hand of the second chance and calls you home to him. And each one of us. Each one of us at that point is given a chance to respond to that hand. It's the hand of the second chance. And no matter how far we strayed from God, no matter what act we've done, no matter what we've done in our lives, things that maybe you're incredibly embarrassed about, and maybe you've done some things that make you feel totally unworthy before God, do you grasp that God still issues the invitation, come home? That, when we accept that invitation, he will forgive our sins, and if we repent, it's quite amazing how God restores us. And people so often say to me, Mark, I can't possibly be one with God. I can't possibly have a relationship with God. I've done too many things in my lives. I put too many obstacles in God's way. Well, hear this. You're not alone. Sinfulness in my own life was one of my biggest obstacles, one of my biggest barriers to grace. And do you know what? It's not a new concept. Way back in the dawn of creation, when God created the universe, the solar system, when he created the plant life, the birds, the fish, the animals, and finally when he created humankind in his, in his own image, the Genesis account, the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, tells us that God created all human beings in his own image. In the image of God, you and I were shaped and molded, pushed, stamped into the very DNA fabric of our being, was this image of God. But still, all of humankind were prepared to give up that paradise, to give up that kind of perfect communion with God, to grab the steering wheel, to take over the reins, to be in charge. And so amidst all the beauty work, all the beauty of God's handiwork, the realization was that man and woman, you and me, chose to be like God. And so it wasn't difficult for Adam and Eve to sin. If you and I had been there, we would have probably done exactly the same things that they did. And so when the evil one comes, he comes to Eve and he says, he says this, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And from that time on, 
all of us wanted to be like God. We tried to take God's place right at the center of the universe. We wanted to be the important ones. We wanted to push God out and away from us. And so we chose another path. And that allowed sin to separate us from this fellowship that we had with God. Instead of being God-centered, instead of worshiping God, instead of giving glory back to God, which we as unique creatures stamped in the image of God are, created, are capable of doing, we chose to be self-centered. And each of us comes to a point in our life where we feel this kind of disconnect from God. We feel cut off from God. And we need to be restored. In, in a sense, we need to come home. Restored from our sin. Whatever that may be. You see, for me, my sin was hardness of heart. For me, my sin was anger. For me, my sin was pride. For me, my sin was blasphemy. There was a point in my life when the name of Jesus was like a swear word on my lips. It would roll off like a curse rather than the kind of words of love that it should be. Why? Because it was easy. It was socially acceptable. And that's not a boast. That's a reality. But you see, that all changed one day. That changed when a young man who was lost to God, who was angry, was brought back into the outstretched arms of God. The rubber band, that kind of rubber band that kind of attaches to our souls. God started pulling me back. Even though I'd stretched it, I felt a breaking point at one stage in my life. God kept making it tighter and tighter as He brought me back by His grace. I don't know if you've ever been at a point in your life walk where you're kind of wondering if you'll ever make the grade. Wondering if you've done so much in life that God will ever forgive you for. Wondering if you've had to be a perfect individual before God would even think of accepting you. And I just love the story. Many of you would have heard it. It's the story of Albert McMakin, who was a 24-year-old farmer who came to faith in Christ. And he was really full of enthusiasm. So he used to load people up in his truck and he used to track them to where this kind of uh, meeting was taking place. But he really was trying to get a very good looking farmer's son to join him. But this guy seemed to be falling in and out of love with girls all the time. So he really battled to persuade him to come along and seemed totally kind of disinterested in Christianity. But eventually Albert McMakin enabled him to come along because he said, well, you can drive my truck. And in those days that was a big thing. And so he came and he drove the truck to this place where the meeting was taking place. And he recalls later that this person was absolutely spellbound as he sat under the teaching and under God's covering. And he went back again and again and again until one night he gave his life to Jesus. He was 24 at the time and this was way back in 1934. And since then Billy Graham, who died recently in his 90s, led thousands to faith in Christ Jesus. But realize this today. Billy Graham had to shift his thinking patterns. And it might require a paradigm shift for you too. A shift in your thinking patterns. Because the most striking point in our reading is this. Why? And we, we're talking about reading from Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 1 to 9. Why? Because all religions apart from the Christian faith, begin on a note of people seeking after God. Only the Bible starts with a view that God seeks after humankind. When God asks a question in Genesis chapter 3 verse 9, Adam, where are you? It's the first question in the Hebrew Bible. And it's matched by the first question in the New Testament. So here it is. God is asking, Adam, where are you? But the New Testament in Matthew's Gospel, the first question that comes, it comes from a certain wise man who comes asking, where is he? Where is the Messiah? Matthew chapter 2 verse 2. And on that note, let me unpack the Adam and Eve story a little bit more deeply for you today. Of course, you've heard this story before. I'm sure it's not in the Bible. Just bear with me. Adam was walking around the Garden of Eden, as you can imagine, feeling very lonely. So he asked God, well, God asked him, Adam, what's wrong with you? And Adam said in that voice, like when a man gets man flu, Lord, I don't have anyone to talk to. And God said, then I will give you a companion and she will be called a woman. 
The person will cook for you, wash your clothes. She will agree with every decision you make. She'll bear your children. She'll never expect you to get up in the middle of the night. She will not nag you. She'll always be the first to admit she's wrong whenever you have a disagreement. She'll never get a headache. She'll never question your behavior or the company you keep. She'll support you. She'll understand every decision you make throughout your life. And she won't put up with any nonsense. Adam and ask, Adam then asked God, God, what will this cost? And God said, well, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And Adam said, oh, God, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> Look, that's definitely not in the Bible, so I just cancel that. But here's the real story. Here's the real story. Adam and Eve are placed in the magnificent Garden of Eden. They are guardians of the garden. It's plentiful. It's lush. It's a wonderful garden. And what's more, there's an intimacy. God is intimately close with them. Walk in the garden in the heat of the afternoon. As the narrator whispers to us, and they're both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Genesis 2.25. And that is essentially about who they were at that stage. Innocent, open, safely vulnerable in this close relationship with God. And you can see that maybe if you ever pick up a little baby, you can see that the baby, the eyes open, kind of looking at you and you stare into their face. Uh, it just seems so bright, so curious as they hold your gaze and they kind of stay relaxed and kind of in their present moment and just gazing right back at you. However, from that ordered perfection of the cosmos in Genesis chapter 1 and the idyllic perfection of the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, it takes two and a half chapters for this wholeness and this perfection to be disturbed. The only limit, the only limit Adam and Eve are given the one and only restriction on their delight and their freedom is this prohibition against eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, because they're human, in the exact way that you and I are human, they reach their hands out and they kind of grasp the one thing that is not theirs. They do the one thing they're asked to abstain from and to respect. And when they do, immediately their eyes are opened. They see they are naked and they hide. And they cover behind the bushes. Fig trees are kind of, fig leaves, sorry, not fig tree. Fig leaves are put over to cover some of their parts, some of their private parts. And, and God asks them a simple yet profound question in Hebrew. It says this, Ayekaha, where are you? Adam knows that he's not kind of being asked just for his GPS coordinates where he's hiding behind a bush and where he's quaking. Adam answers, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. And then God asks a second question and points out the first. Who told you you were naked? And as soon as this kind of self-awareness kind of dawns, Adam first tries to hide physically, covering himself up, then hiding behind a bush trying to get out of God's sight. And then Adam shifts the guilt, doesn't he? He shifts the blame. He says, the woman you gave me gave me the fruit and I ate it. Ish. And Eve replies, the snake enticed me, so I ate it. The snake made me do it. Ish. When you're suddenly caught with your fig leaf down, the impulse is to hide and to blame someone else. Eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve ingest and kind of internalize a conscience. Before that moment, the prohibition not to eat from the tree was a boundary that God had asserted. Like a toddler and like a toddler's parent, any boundaries the parent sets are for the child's well-being. Without the child really understanding what is at stake. And as soon as Adam and Eve taste the fruit and their eyes are opened, they're able to distinguish between good and bad. And they begin to understand the impact of the choice that they have just made. And now they are aware. They chose to eat the forbidden fruit and thought they'd done so in secret. They considered it, ah, oh, they considered the pleasure of it and the knowledge it would give, but did not consider the consequences. They didn't grasp what was at stake. Now they get it, but it's too late. It may remind you of when you were young and you went out to a hypermarket for the first time or a big grocery store for the first time. I grew up in a country area, so <laughs> when we came into the city, that's where we went. And your mom and dad would drag you around, or your mom particularly would probably drag you around for hours, 
and you try on jeans and you try on shoes and perhaps you never bought any of them but you just try them on I mean it's so much easier nowadays with take a lot and whatever else that's out there so much easier anyway I don't know if any of you got yourself deliberately lost in those places and then your name would come out or come over the intercom well mr. so-and-so please come and collect their child from the front desk and of course you probably got a bit of a paddy whacking too when you were found you know very un PC in those days <laughs> but you had a short memory and you probably went off and did it again the next time you're in the shop some of you maybe some of you maybe not but isn't it interesting that the first transgression in the Hebrew Bible is not any of what some of us would call big sins or label big sins it's not murder that comes a chapter later it's not stealing or incest that comes later but it's more profound than that it's a breach in the fundamental relationship a breach in intimacy which creates separation and it creates distance some of you know that experience that disconnect experience when you discover that a friend a partner a child someone close to you did something that ruptures the parameters of your relationship there is a kind of trust deficit that comes with that or you made a choice that ruptured a connection that you had built with someone it's not just the action per se that causes the damage but what it does to the trust relationship and Adam realizes Adam realizes that his actions have altered the depths of his closeness with God and now there's no going back and no way to undo it I heard your voice I was afraid because I was naked we hide and sometimes we put a mask on too even to this day we hide our actions we are ashamed of we hide the shame that we feel we hide our hurts and our disappointments we hide how hard we are struggling and how much help we need we hide our true feelings from other people we hide aspects of ourselves and maybe we grown to hate about ourselves we find hundreds of different ways of doing that but you see God doesn't allow us to hide God asks this question Ayeka where are you where are you show yourself is what he's saying it's an invitation for you and for me to be liberated from our shame liberated from the fake smile liberated from the brave face that we sometimes put on God is saying to them and God is saying to us right now show yourselves show your flawed naked honest and responsible selves because I want to continue this relationship you see God wanted Adam and Eve to hear this he was telling Adam and Eve that he would take it upon himself to repair the damage that they had caused through their disobedience yes and if you read this, carry on reading you'll find he put enmity enmity between Satan and his seed and the woman and her seed there's this kind of enmity in other words God would restore the broken relationship between us and him how through the seed of a woman the woman's seed would bruise the serpent's head he would destroy the serpent's power permanently God did that when God fulfilled his promise by sending his son Jesus into the world Jesus was the promised seed of a woman born to the Virgin Mary to defeat the evil one's works as the, at the battle of the ages on the cross Jesus suffering and death on that cross was a real and painful he endured all the torment of hell, hell that you and I deserved and Jesus suffering wasn't permanent he rose from the dead and by the power of his death and by the power of his resurrection Jesus has crushed the serpent's head that is what is meant in our gospel reading today when Jesus said how can Satan drive out Satan only divine authority can do that and by his death Jesus bound the strong man and stole us away from the house of hell and by his resurrection Jesus declares his victory over sin and death Satan has no power over us and it's by the power of this promise the promise made and kept in Christ that the Lord the God of all grace and the God of all mercy restores our relationships with him so when God comes to you asking Ayeka where are you we don't need to hide we don't need to cover up our sin 
We don't need to play the blame game like Adam did to Eve. We can skip over all that stuff and just confess. Open ourselves up to God. We can confess our sins with an understanding. An understanding that Jesus Christ paid the price because 2,000 years ago on a cross, God staked his final claim of glory. When he sent his son to die on the cross for each one of us, for you and for me. And that is the central point around which history revolves. And he did it for you and he did it for me. Because the cross of Jesus provides a victory for all of us over sin. The cross of Jesus provides a victory so that each of us can have a new life in Christ. Finally, the critical question for us is this. This we understand when we open our hearts to God and we accept the relationship that God offers us through Jesus Messiah. When we hear that cry that speaks into our souls that says, where are you? Think about it. If you were the last person on this earth and needed saving, Jesus would still have died for you. Centuries before you were born, Jesus came to suffer so that you could have eternal life. Centuries before you were born, Jesus came to demonstrate God's love for you. That is grace. While we're still weak at the right time, Messiah Jesus died for each one of us. Before we even existed, God provided a means for our salvation. Jesus loves you. Come home is what we are sharing today. Where are you? Hayeko. Come home. Amen. Bless you. Thank you for joining us today.